Well, good morning. It's so good to see all of you. I invite you to stand as you're able as we come together to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, my name is Sam, and I'm serving as interim here at FPC Gatesville for just a few more weeks, um, but so happy to be worshiping alongside of you. Uh, I'm going to read this passage of scripture over us this morning as we, we come together. This is from Psalm 118, beginning in verse 22. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I invite you to sing as we worship this morning. together my hope is built my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly trust in Jesus name we'll sing that again my hope is built is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest grace, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. We'll sing together Christ alone, Christ alone. Come. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless stand before the throne. See Christ alone.
church. Amen. Christ alone, we have strength and hope. You may have a seat. great day to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, I was reading scripture and I read Psalm 86 1 which says, you know, we thank him for giving us the, like we enter his temple with praise and this is the temple, right? We are the temple. So we're so glad you're here with us. Whether you're online watching or you're in person, we are just so thankful that you're here today. I want to turn your attention to the bulletin. If you picked one up on the way out uh, before you came in and you'll notice if you're new or you just have a change of address or want to give us more information, there's a part where you can tear out. It's a welcome connect card, and uh, that just helps us give us more information if you want to you know, tell us a little bit about yourself, if you're new or you've changed addresses. On the back side of that is comments and prayer requests, so we pray the staff every Monday. So if you have a prayer request, we would love to partner with you in prayer. I want to turn your attention to the front of the bulletin and tell you that the Steward Small Group meets for the last time this semester tonight at 6.30 in the parlor. Uh, we have the last adult Bible study this Wednesday, uh, and Mother's Day is next Sunday. How about that? You know, how about that? All the moms, I mean, mo mothers are incredible people, and so uh, don't forget to honor them, and, you know, I've already sent my mom her Mother's Day card. I hope she's not watching, so she's not, she doesn't know about that, but I've already sent her her card. So uh, be sure to send your mothers and the women in your life who mother other people as well. Uh, gifts and just thank them for that. Uh, next Wednesday night, so not this coming Wednesday, the 4th, but the 11th, is going to be the last student and kids Bible study on Wednesday night, and we're sure we're going to have a good time. And then May 14th, we're doing a men's ministry breakfast, but it's going to be off-site, so we're meeting up at the church early, and then we're taking the van to Lake Belton, and we're going to feed some fishermen and just get to have a good time. Uh, and then finally, youth camp is coming up May 30th through June 4th. If you're interested or you know a youth, we're taking 6th through 12th grade to Lacey Springs with the Greater Houston Camp Association. We'd love to see them there. Uh, finally, before I end and get off, uh, there is a deacon interest meeting after, which is not just for people who are interested in being deacons, but it's about the process. And Dr. Steve North is going to lead that, so we hope you stick around for that. What a great Sunday, you know, what a great day to be together in the house of the Lord. Would you pray with me as we continue our worship? God, we are so grateful. We're grateful that you've given us a place where we can freely gather and worship you. We're grateful that you've sent Jesus to die for us. We're grateful that you created us and you created the world. Lord, as we continue in our time of worship, may it honor you. May the words that Mark speaks and Sam sings today be glorifying to your ears. May we truly live a life devoted to you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as we continue to worship this morning. Oh, worship, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His power and His love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion and splendor. Oh, tell us my
sing together this song of encouragement. Be strong. Be strong in the Lord and be of good courage. Your mighty defender is always the same. Mount up with wings as the eagle ascending. Victory protect you wherever you go. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord and be of good courage for He is your God. Be strong, be strong. with me. Lord, as we silently close our eyes, let us think of all the good things that you have done for us, all the near misses that we have had, and all the times that we have come out triumphant when we never did really deserve it. And at this time, Lord, let us reach into our pockets and decide, Lord, you take care of everybody in this world. If I give some money, you can help them. 
So it's not only what you do for us, but what we do through you for other people. These things we ask in your name. Amen. This next song we sing together, um, it may be a new song for many of you, but I invite you um, to listen. I invite you to sing along however you feel comfortable. Um, the words of this song are our call to action. As Christ followers, we're not called to just sit in the grace and mercy we receive, but we've been called to share that grace and mercy with the world. And it's a battle. It's a battle that we are fighting against a foe. And we all know who that foe is. This church is called, I mean, this, this song is called O Church Arise. So whenever you're ready, I invite you to sing along. O church arise and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our captain. For now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given. With shield of faith and belt of truth, we'll stand against the devil's lies. An army bold whose battle cry is love, reaching out to those in darkness. to war, to love the captive soul, but to rage against the captor, and with the sword that makes the wounded whole, we will fight with faith and valor. When faced with trials on every side, we know will have the price for which he died, an inheritance of nations. Come see the cross where love and mercy meet, as the Son of God is stricken. Then see his foes lie crushed beneath his feet, for the conqueror you to hear these words from the book of Ephesians chapter 4. If you will, please stand for the reading. This is chapter 4, beginning in verse 14. So, 
so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. You may have a seat. pretty good grasp of the Bible and uh, how I teach it to my Sunday school class. Granted, I've been asked to step down a few times, but I mean, heresy is such a loose term these days. But I think if you put all the jigsaw pieces of the puzzle of the Bible together, I think I have a pretty good idea to teach anybody a little thing or two. Okay, so uh, share some of your knowledge with us. Okay, no problem on that one. Um, the Bible really doesn't get cooking until Moses built the ark. And the, Wait, no, um, no. He was the one that parted the Red Sea. He was also the one that wrestled with God in the river of Gabok. And if it wasn't for that, he wouldn't have been able to part that river too. But that was a foreshadowing. That was a prophecy for the New Testament when Luke would be in that river going, hey, I thought I could walk on water. And that was a foreshadowing of King Nebuchadnezzar telling King David, go get those people out of that water because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do not belong there. And that is how King James became the greatest king of Israel. I believe in putting the words into action. You know what I mean? I mean, it's one thing to talk the talk. It's another one to walk the walk. All right? Case in point. I taught my kids the other day about David and Goliath, right? Now my youngest son, he's got mad skills with a slingshot. You know, I, I could tell you several stories of us, you know, putting the word into action. Uh, one of the most recent ones is I told my boys about, you know, Joseph and his brothers. And my oldest son, my oldest son, Tried to sell his brother to the next door neighbor for a coat. My little entrepreneur. Bob was proud. And it was a nice coat. I'm a big fan of the Bible. I mean, who wouldn't be? It's in most hotel chains. I have one. Probably two. I know I have a non-reading one in our living room. It's beautiful. It's right underneath our plaque that says, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm such a fan. I became a fan of the Bible on Facebook. Big fan. So um, how often do you read the Bible? I'm a big fan. I don't see what the big deal is about, you know, memorizing scripture or carrying a big old clunky Bible everywhere. I mean, I have multiple translations of the Bible right here on my phone and on my digital reader, you know? And when I get to church, it's up on the screens. I don't really need to carry. I mean, carrying a big Bible anymore is just passe. Don't you think that having your own Bible helps you plant God's Word inside your heart? Really? So like, you know, thy Word is a, a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path? You talking like Psalm 119, 113? I'm sorry, I, I guess you do know quite a bit of Scripture on your own then. Nope. Just Google it. This is my grandmother's Bible. She used to read to me out of this Bible when I was just a kid. She passed away this summer. A family member gave it to me because they knew I was a believer. To them, it was just a book. But to me, when I sit down and I read it, I see all her little notes. I see all the little highlighted pages, the dog-eared pages. I see the things that really meant something to her when God was speaking to her through his word. And I realize it's her faith that's passed on to me that was passed from her parents to her. 
And you know what? It impacts my faith. More than anything, this truly is the living word. The Bible, it truly is the living word of God. A couple of my pri most prized possessions are two Bibles. One was owned by my mom, who we lost 16 years ago. The other one is owned by my mother-in-law. And I sit and I have both of those in my office and I read through them and I read their notes and I'm just like that last guy on the video where it just, it, it means something to see what God was saying to them in those moments, to soak that in. And those are two of my most prized possessions because it's something that gets passed down. But when you look at the Bible, when you look at what this book is, one of the things that we acknowledge is that most everybody in the world can tell you what it is. Whether they're a believer or a non-believer, they can look at this and go, well, I know that's the Bible. And I know it has historical significance. And I know it's full of drama and it's full of intrigue and it's full of love. And I know there's a reason for it. As Christians, we take it to the next level and we say, you know what, we know it's valuable. We know it's something to be treasured. We know it's God speaking to us. And we're, we are very familiar with what's containing in its pages because we're so much exposed to it over the years in children's ministry and youth ministry and Sunday school classes and all the hundreds of different sermons that we've heard preached from its pages. And we could say, you know what, I know what it is. I know what's contained in here. I know what God is trying to tell me. But do we really? There was a recent study that was performed by the Barna Group in which they said that 49% of all of those that profess to be Christians actually read their Bible. 49%. And of that, it's half of that that actually will say it's the living word of God. What that tells me is there's a lack of knowledge, there's a lack of focus, there's a lack of understanding of what's actually contained within these pages. And one of the reasons for that is because we've become so accustomed to being like the techie in the video. And there's nothing wrong with having digital copies of the Bible. I've got it. I've got it on my computer. I've got it on my iPad. I've got it on my iPhone. I carry it with me. I'll pull up quick references. Absolutely. There's nothing wrong with it. But when we become so accustomed to reading a verse here and a verse there, or we use Google to pull something up, we're not engulfed in the Word of God. We're not able to see the passages that are coming before it, the passages that are coming after it. We're not able to see the context. We're not able to understand on a deeper level what God is trying to tell us. We don't understand just how vitally important the Bible is when it comes to our history, when it comes to who God is. And God, the creator of the universe, the Alpha and Omega, the Father, everything to us speaks to us through the Bible. This is the way that he chooses to speak into our lives and to guide us and to direct us. It's in scripture that God himself reveals himself to us. And it's through the studying of his word that we develop a deeper relationship. When we look at the, at the Bible from Genesis 1 all the way through Revelation 22 is one message. We have the Old Testament, we have the New Testament combined. They make one grand narrative that exposes, explains who the character of God is. Contained within its passages are instructions for us on how to live our daily lives as disciples. Contained within its, its pages are words of encouragement, words of wisdom, words of guidance that will help us get through the struggles, the trials, the temptations that we have in our lives. To be able to handle the hundreds of decisions that we are faced with every single day. What's the Bible? It's everything. 
It's everything. And it should be. The early church, they knew this. They understood this. And they went to the scriptures to f- seek out wisdom, to seek out discernment, to figure out how to stand up in the face of the opposition that was facing them, that was coming strong at them. They remember, they were being persecuted. The religious leaders of the time, the Sanhedrin, were persecuting them. They were arresting them. They were beating them. They were telling them, don't preach in the name of Jesus. How did they have the courage? How did they have the boldness to do it? How did they have the ability to stand up? It's because they knew Scripture. They knew who God was. This morning, what I wanted to do is I want to look at two questions that oftentimes comes to our minds when we think about the Bible. Number one is, what is this? And number two is, how do I approach it to study it? When you look at the Bible, it's not a single book. It's a collection of 66 different books written by different authors over an extended period of time. Now, if you take any other book in our world and you do that, you're going to have viewpoints, you're going to have, have all kinds of things that will span the spectrum of what they're about. But there's one common theme that runs through the Bible, and that's who God is and what he wants for his children. 66 different books written, over, written by different authors over an extended, long period of time, and they all flow together with that common theme. It's the inspired word of God. The Bible has been a great inspiration, a great source of inspiration for some of the most famous pieces of art, musical compositions, or literature that the world has ever known. And it has also been the subject of the biggest and heated debates that the world has ever known. Why? Because of the significance, because of the value it carries. You know, as believers, as followers of Christ, we need to understand this. And we need to be able to come to a point where we know what is in there. And we do that by spending time steeping in the word. By understanding what God is speaking to us. Not by a little fast food thing or a little fly by night by just pulling out a digital reader. But actually sitting there and reading through it like a fine dining experience. Soaking it in. Savoring every moment. We need to understand what's in there so we can be strong in our convictions. So we can be faithful to the message that it contains. And it contains the message of the gospel. The entirety of scripture is the gospel. God's love for his children and what he's willing to do and how he's willing to give us everything. A message that's not easily heard. A message that's not easily accepted. A message that, let's just face it, is offensive. And so as a global church, one of the things that we've tried to do is we've tried to water it down. We eliminate different pieces because it may offend somebody. We, we don't want to speak on certain harsh topics. We don't want to point out the sin in somebody's life because that will offend them. That will make them mad. So we tell them what they want to hear. And then we look out and go, man, look at the crowds that are gathering. Well, yeah, but if you tell somebody what they want to hear, you're going to have the crowds. The gospel is offensive. It should be offensive. Because what it's doing is it's pointing out that we are broken and we are sinful and we need a savior. To do anything less is dishonoring God and it's dishonoring the actions on the cross. God calls on us to give up the ways of sin. He calls on us to give up the ways that look so promising, that look look so inviting, and to turn to the truth that contains underneath it, the fold. And it's painful, and it's hard to hear sometimes, but when we commit ourselves to walk in the ways of God, to walk in the path that leads to righteousness, to lean to God, to say, hey, tell me, guide me, direct me. Christ will equip us with the things that we need. 
to be able to stand up, to be strong, to stand boldly in the face of persecution and opposition that's there. In our passage this morning, I want us to take just a little bit closer look at what is contained inside this, this book. We say, well, what is the Bible? Why do I need to spend time reading it? The answer to that is found over in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 12, it says these words. In fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. All who live, want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be. It doesn't say maybe, doesn't say you might face it. It says you will be persecuted. Evil people and imposters will become worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned. Now, one of the things I want to stop right there for just a sec. Paul has taken Timothy under his wing and he is discipling him. He is teaching him the way of the faith. He is teaching him to be able to go and minister and to serve and to spread this message. And he's warning him that you are going to face false teachers. There are going to be people that are going to oppose this. You will be persecuted by sharing the message that God has called you to share. Just know that right off. He says, you know those who taught you. And you know that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture, all scripture, doesn't say some, doesn't say parts of it, it says all. We're talking Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, all scripture, all of it is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking for correcting, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. What's in the Bible? Everything we ever need is found in the Bible. It's God's word to us, telling us how to live, telling us how to handle the situations we're gonna be facing. Good and bad is found in the passages. When we live our lives as followers of Christ, we're going to go through trials and struggling. We're going to be faced with temptations. We are going to be faced with heartaches, but we're also going to celebrate. All of that's a guarantee. It's going to happen. There's no avoiding it. In fact, Jesus himself tells us this over in the book of John in chapter 15, starting in verse 18, where he says, if the world hates you, understand that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. Pause right there. You see these big crowds gathering because they're hearing what they want to hear? Yeah, of course you're going to love somebody who's telling you exactly what you want to hear. The world will love you if you are of the world. If you're not saying anything offensive, if you're not stepping on toes, yeah, they're going to love every part of you. They're going to love everything that's coming out of your mouth. However, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it, what happens? The world hates you. The world hates you. Peter and the other apostles understood that risk. They understood what God was telling them and calling them to do. And because of it, they stood boldly in the face of opposition. And because of it, lives are changed. And because of it, God's kingdom grows. We're able to do this because, they were able to do this because they spent time investing with God. When you look at that video, where do you fall? When you, look, when you consider the Bible, when you consider how much time you spend reading the Bible, do you fall with one of these characters that were up there? Are you the one that would say, hey, I know what's in there. I absolutely know what's in there. And then when you get pressed or you get questioned, you say things like Moses building the ark. Or are you the one that says, oh, I'm a huge fan of the Bible. Man, I've got bookshelves full. When's the last time you read it? Oh, I'm a big fan. As a matter of fact, I could, I could hand out to you what I got right now. Are you the techie? 
that immediately looks for a phone when you want to say something because you don't have it here? Or are you the one that says, this is valuable, and I know what's contained in it, and you cherish it, and you spend time in it? You want to get to a point to where you feel so close and so connected with God? You want to get to a point where you feel God speaking into your life? You have to spend time with him. You have to spend time in prayer. You have to spend time observing his words. You have to spend time investing. Think about your relationships in this world. Those of y'all that are married, you want strong marriages? Those of you that have kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, you want good, strong relationships with them? That doesn't happen fly by night. You can't have a strong marriage if you don't spend time investing in each other, having conversations, spending quality time. It doesn't happen when you're spending once a week saying, hey, how's it going? You don't have a strong marriage if that is you. It takes investment. It takes quality. You want kids, relationship with the kids, great grandkids, great, 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 the list can go on. You have it when you spend time with them. Learning what they like. Sharing, passing on your faith. You could tell that guy in the video, the last one, it moved him that his grandmother's Bible was in his possession. Why? What was the first thing he said? I remember her reading to me out of the Bible. That's time investing to ensure it's passing on. Why would we ever think different about our relationship with God? You want to know who God is? You want to hear him speaking into your life? You open the Bible. And he will. C.S. Lewis put it this way, we come to scripture not to learn a subject, but to steep ourselves in a person. We come to scripture to learn who God is. We come to scripture to learn what he wants for our lives. We come to scripture learning how to have a relationship with him that's meaningful. We come to scripture to learn what he wants for his children. Every decision we ever make in our life, every struggle we will ever face in our life, every temptation we will ever come across, the answer on how to handle it is right here. Nowhere else. Right here. In this crazy, mixed-up world, we are constantly looking for answers. We're constantly searching for somebody to tell us the truth. We're constantly looking for something to believe in. We're constantly looking for something to depend on, something that's reliable, something that we can count on, something that we can say yes. And too many times, a lot of people, a lot of Christians, believe the false teachers because they're the ones that are speaking the loudest because they're telling you what you want to hear or we go to social media, or we go to that wonderful invention called the internet. Because every answer and everything is on the internet, and you can trust everything that you read on the internet. Instead of turning to God's word. Paul is explaining in this passage that we need to be so devoted to the scriptures that it flows out of us. We need to be so devoted that when you look back in Mark chapter 4, when you look back at Jesus being tempted in the wilderness and Satan throws pieces of scripture out to him, Jesus is able to bat it back and go, nope, that's not what scripture says, this is what it says. Because remember, when you look back into Genesis and the fall, how did Satan get a foothold? Because Eve said, Oh, God said we can't eat it or touch it because we're going to die. That's not what God said. But that's what she said, and Satan grabbed a hold. Paul is telling Timothy and us, we need to be so devoted to the scriptures that we see reveals us the very nature of God. 
and the nourishing truths that will help us persevere in the pursuit of godliness. The sad reality is that many of us don't invest the time like we should. We know it's a good idea. We know it's important. We know we should do it. Heck, we may even start out doing it. But the number one, number one New Year's resolution for believers is I'm going to read more Scripture. I'm going to spend more time invested in Scripture. Why is that the number one every single year? Because we don't follow through with it. And we don't follow through with it because it's confusing. It's irrelevant. It's boring. I mean, think about it. Leviticus, detail after detail after detail after detail of rules that the Israelites were supposed to follow or the genealogies that seem like they go on forever. It becomes dry when we don't understand, when we don't invest. It's easy to think those things. And if those thoughts have ever entered your mind, you're not alone. You're not alone. These thoughts creep in, I think, because we honestly don't know how to approach it. I've heard people say, I want to start reading my scripture more. I want to start diving into the Bible more. How do I start? Do I just pick a book and go, okay, I'll start reading? Or do I choose one of the thousand reading plans that are out there? Or do I create my own? Or how do I know what's right and how do I know what's wrong? And those are legitimate questions. But how do you approach it? Regardless of which avenue you take, there's two things that you have to do. Number one is you have to open the book. I mean, you can't read it like this. Even though a lot of people try. You have to open and you have to read. You have to open and you have to read. The only way that's going to get from here to here. This morning, I want to lay out three easy steps on how to approach and study God's Word. Three easy steps that will help us in getting the most out of understanding that the God who gave us everything is speaking to us. Step number one, prepare our hearts to receive through prayer. Prepare our hearts to receive through prayer. Mark chapter four, verses four through eight says, as he sowed some seed fell along the path and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it didn't have much soil and it grew up quickly. The soil wasn't deep. When the sun came up, it was scorched and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it didn't produce fruit. Still other seed fell on ground around it, and it grew up, producing fruit that increased 30, 60, and 100 times. Before we can truly take in what God is saying, our hearts have to be ready to receive it. And they're received by prayer. They're received by saying, God, Show me what you want me to get. Speak to me. Allow your words to penetrate my heart. And then let him. We have to be prepared through prayer. God is speaking into our hearts when we go to him in prayer. We just have to be willing to listen. We have to be willing to receive. The second, reading and observing what the text is saying. Reading and observing what the text is saying. Now this is one of the most simplest and it's also the one of the most important when it comes to reading the text. What do you do when you read the text? We simply look at what stands out to us. 
What is God communicating? What are the words saying? How many of you growing up and maybe even on reruns have watched the show Columbo? Uh huh. Quite a few hands are popping up there. Yeah, I loved that show growing up. This guy, he was a goofy character of all kinds, and he wore this big trench coat. He carried this notepad, had this big cigar, and would walk around, and he annoyed every person he came across. As a matter of fact, when his car would pull up on the scene or when he'd walk into a room, you could almost hear the eye rolling. It's like, oh, man, it's him again. Why were they acting that way? Because he was annoying. Why was he annoying? Because he wanted to know every little detail. And he would spend time, you'd watch him kind of circling around whoever it was that committed the crime. He would circle around and he's observing what was there, what was missing, what are people saying, what are people doing, what is going on in this moment. And he had one famous tagline that you always knew the moment he said it, he knew who committed the crime. And he was zeroing in. Because he'd go, oh, one more thing. Oh, one more thing. That meant he understood what was going on. And then he went on a journey applying what he knew. When we approach Scripture, we should, need, we should be looking, going, okay, well, what's happening? Who wrote this passage? Why was it written? To whom was it written? What happened prior? What happened after? What is God trying to say in this moment? And then when we get to that level, we can go, oh, one more thing. Let me read a little deeper. Okay, God, how do you want me to apply this to my life? At that point, we can start applying the scripture to our lives because God is speaking to you right here. Asking questions is an important step if you want to understand who God is and what he wants for your life. Step three, applying the text to our lives. Applying the text to our lives. Hebrews chapter four, starting in verse 12, it says, for the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart, and no creature is hidden from him. But all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The Bible is the living word of God. And we should be engaged in it. We should be studying it. We should let it flow off the pages and soak into our hearts. We should be going to it with everything that we need. With the help of the Holy Spirit, the process of purifying our hearts begins. God, I'm struggling in this part of my life. Answer's here. God, my marriage is on the rocks and I'm not sure how to handle it. The answer's here. My kids don't want to listen to me. The answer's here. God, I'm dealing with an addiction. The answer's here. I don't know what direction to go in life. I don't know where you're calling me to serve. I don't know what you're giving me as a gift. Everything is here. Are we reading it? Are we listening to what God has to say? One of my all-time favorite 19th century theologians is a gentleman named Charles Spurgeon. I absolutely love reading Charles Spurgeon. As a matter of fact, I said two cherished, treasured, uh, prized possessions. I've actually got a third one. When I was ordained, the the council of deacons gave me a Bible. It was a Charles Spurgeon study Bible. And I love that. And I study it and I read through it. And Charles Spurgeon said this one time, a Bible that is falling apart 
usually belongs to someone who's not. A Bible that is falling apart is usually belonging to someone who's not. The guy on the video said, I got a non-reader sitting in the living room. We should never have a non-reader. We should have duct tape attached to the binder to keep it hold. It should be falling apart. You open it up, pages should be falling out. They're so worn out. Because I guarantee if that's your Bible, as Charles Spurgeon said, your life isn't that way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the way that you speak to us, for the way that you guide us and direct us, for the way that you love us. God, we are so grateful that you came and you loved us first, that you sent your son for us to connect with us, to free us from our bondage to sin. God, and you gave us the greatest act of love, and then you have gave us the greatest tool to use, your word. Help us not to see this as something to be sitting on a shelf or sitting on a table to be admired from looking through glass, but to actually be so worn out from our reading and studying and investing in it. God, we know that everything we ever need is in these pages. And we know that because you've told us that. In our passage this morning, you told us that all Scripture, all of it, not just part of it. God, help us to move forward, looking at the opportunities that we can to invest in your word to letting it soak in. God, and if we, if we find ourselves in a place where we struggle with how to start, how do I start reading it? How do I start studying it? Or I've got questions. God, give us the opportunities to have those people in our lives that we can reach out to and say, well, how, about, how about you and I? We, we start a reading plan and we hold each other accountable. And God, if there's anybody in here that's struggling with this, if there's anybody in here who is feeling distant from you, if there's anybody in here who feels like they need more and they need a relationship with you, God, I just pray that they take this moment now and they just say, God, I need you and I need your word. It's in your name we pray. As we go into our final song, Matt and I will be down here at the front. If you need prayer, please come down. This is your opportunity. We also have the altar open. There's no shame in coming and kneeling at the altar and saying, God, I'm struggling and I need prayer. Or turn to the person next to you and say, would you say a prayer with me? Or you know what? I really need to read my Bible more and I need that as a prayer request. Whatever it happens to be, this is your time.
second. Now, you're not getting out of it that quick. <laughs> Come on up. Uh, many of y'all know our sister, Sharon. She has decided to move her membership back here. She said, this is where I belong. And we are so glad to have her uh, here in a minute. Doc's got a good presentation and stuff, but please make sure that you say we are glad to have you with us. Doc. 